you all so much for coming out. We really don't take it lightly that you choose to spend your week with us. And one last thing, Nathan and the collective team just really want to connect with you individually. So if there, if you are new here and you haven't had a chance to really connect with someone on the leadership team, please pull us aside. We would love to connect with you over coffee, over lunch, dinner if we can. Just please, please be intentional about that. We're not trying to miss you. So. Um, just pull either Gio, Kyle, Nathan, Jana, Michelle, myself, Joel, Daniel, Hope, Sam, who else Monica. am I saying? Hope, Adrian, Monica. Is that everyone? Steven. Oh, Steven. Oh, Steven, you're the best. Sorry. Okay. Is that, is that good? Daniel. Okay. I think I said Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Okay. Did you get you? Justin Timberlake, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I saw Justin looks like JT. Okay. Um, all right, guys. I, I'm really super excited to share with you tonight. I'm like almost jumping out of my skin, so I'm just like, Lord, pace me here. Because um, it really is an honor to stand up here and be his messenger for what we believe he's, he's wanting to like share with you. Right? We really don't take this position up here lightly. Uh, it's really a humbling thing to have your attention, and so thank you just for, for being here. Tonight's theme is really the same as it's always been. It's about Jesus. Right? We're here for him. Amen. Yeah. And the Lord actually began speaking to me two weeks ago during worship um, at, my, at my church. I go to the harbor down in Pompano. Kyle and I go there with a few of you all. Yeah, Christian. And... He just started like downloading these phrases and words, and I, and I wrote them down in the middle of worship, but I didn't really know what they meant until about a week ago after Nathan spoke. And so I think actually this is a pretty cool extension of what Nathan was talking about last week. How many of you all got to be here for that message? Yeah, it was so good. It was so humbling. And I don't know about you, but there was a definite tension for me during that whole message where he's talking about a life that's trying to imitate Jesus's by prioritizing the things that Jesus valued. He valued rest. He valued humility, community, prayer, the word, and worship. Come on. Right? You got it. You took notes. Worship. I took notes. I did. I did take notes. And I left that night being like, God, I get that this is the way to true life. I truly get that Jesus was our example, and so therefore, that's, that must be what it looks like for me. But I was like, how do I even get there? Because the thing that Nathan's brought up time and time again was that Jesus, even after a day long of ministry, would go off by himself and pray to his father. Yeah. After this, these kind of nights, I go home and I go to bed, or I, <laughs> I go to bed. And the next night, I just, sometimes I just binge on Netflix, just being so honest yeah. with you, right? And so I was like, God, but I know there's more. And so how do I get there? And when, when I was asking him, I felt like he said, the thing that keeps us from where we are now to where we are going, where Jesus wants to take us in him, is our, can be many things. But the thing that he highlighted to me were the offenses that we carry. Oh, wow. Wow. That's good. Wow. Come on. And so, and so um, that really brings me to the title of my message, which the Lord gave me during worship, which was, I had heard this in my spirit, the trap of offense, his love, our defense. The trap of offense, his love, our defense. And so tonight we're really going to go after the deception of offense, the consequences of it. And how if we don't deal with it, it can really influence every aspect of our lives and even hinder our progress with Jesus. And at the end of the night, I'm going to ask you to get honest, to get real with yourself and with Jesus and to allow him to speak to you. Before we do that, let's just define offense. What does the dictionary say is offense? One of them is a thing that constitutes a violation of what is judged to be right or natural. Similar words are affront, slap in the face, insult, injury, or hurt. Another definition is annoyance, 
or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. So in other words, something that is said to you or done to you that you consider to be an insult or attack on your character, values, beliefs, opinions, or actions. And so what is the effect of offense? We grow bitter. We grow resentful. We get frustrated. We have a short fuse. Or maybe we just get lazy, fearful, or feel inadequate. And so I thought it was interesting that the Lord chose to use offense as a trap. I was like, God, why did you use that, that language? And he brought me to Matthew 18, verse 7 and 8. And I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. Woe to the world because of offenses. Wow. For offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. Wow. Wow. I'm going to read that again. (laughs) Woe to the world because of offenses. That first woe. He's talking about Jesus. These are Jesus' words, right? The first woe is a cry of sorrow or distress for a world in danger of offenses, of being offended. The second woe, for offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. The second is a warning to the one who brings evil upon others or causing them to fall into sin. And the word that is translated to offenses is actually scandalon. And Jesus uses that three times in this verse. And scandalon, the meaning of that is the trigger of a trap which bait is placed. Wow. So let's think about it. So so good. So we we I'm from West Virginia. We have river rats. I also lived in West Palm and we have intercoastal rats. And there are things like (laughs) this bit, right? Yeah. And so I in my I lived off of Grayman Drive sophomore year. We had these things everywhere because we had a rat problem. It was awful. But you put a little piece of cheese or a cracker on the bait, right? Or on the little trigger so that they sniff it and then it snaps. That's what offense is. Yeah. Wow. So wow. offense like lures us in. Wow. And it and then it kills us. Right? It like wow. snaps and it totally like it traps us. Right? Jesus, yes. Fall. Oh. Rain. Oh, is that rain? Yes, yeah, rain. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so the word translated to offense literally means to fall into a trap. Wow. So what he's saying here in this verse is you're going to come up against people who say unkind things, who hurt your feelings, who do you wrong, but you don't let it have you don't let it have to cause you to fall into sin or fall into the trap of offense. You don't have to let these minor acts of offense fester, ruminate, and build. What's seemingly inconsequential or subtle to you over time can build into some can build into full blown sin, right? You have the power alone to stop this process, to stop that that process. Mm-hmm. And how many of us actually get offended because of our own insecurities, our own doubts, our own false beliefs about ourselves. Sometimes it's not even about the other person, but it's what is started in our own mind. This was often the case with Jesus. He was not a stranger to offense. And so we're going to still be in Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to read you verses 1 through 6. When Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And get this. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Wow. Wow. Blessed is the one who is not offended by Jesus. 
Whoa. I mean, if you think about it, John spent his whole adult life prophesying about the Messiah to come, right? And he has this beautiful encounter where he baptizes Jesus in the Jordan, and heaven opens up, and he sees the favor of the Father over Jesus. And now John is imprisoned. And I think, I mean, what he's saying is, why aren't you doing more to help me? He was offended, I think. He yeah. Jesus said, blessed is the one who's not offended by me. And I love Jesus' response because he chose to reply in a way that highlighted the focus of his ministry. To heal the hurting and restore the lost. He chose humble acts of service instead of flexing his muscles and shifting the political climate, which is what the Jewish people wanted, right? They wanted a Messiah to come and deliver them from Roman dominance. That's what they wanted. Yeah. But Jesus was not what they were expecting. Wow. Hmm. Thus, his entire ministry to many was offensive. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Huh. That's so good. That's it. So... Can we relate to this? Like, is Jesus' ministry hard for us to receive sometimes? Wow. Do we get impatient? Do we grow weary, discouraged, or fall apart when we think that he's not doing enough wow. on our behalf? Do we create that distance because we think he is sitting back doing nothing? Or do we only want him to the extent that he'll do something for us? Because that was the case in John 6. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 more, 5,000 men plus women and children. And they're coming and looking for him, right? Because they were fed by a miracle, but they didn't really believe in him. They didn't believe who he said he was. And they asked him for another miracle so they might believe. <laughs> right? They're like, well, feed us again. Do it again. And then we'll believe you. What was his response? And I'm going to read this. Verses 47. Starting. It's got like six verses. 47. Okay. I speak to you living truth. Unite your heart to me and believe. And you will experience eternal life. I am the true bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert and died, but standing here before you is the true bread that comes out of heaven. And when you eat this bread, you will never die. I alone am this living bread that has come to you from heaven. Eat this bread and you will live forever. The living bread I give you is my body, which I will offer as a sacrifice so that all may live. Unless you eat the body of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have eternal life. Eternal life comes to the one who eats my body and drinks my blood, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my body is real food for your spirit, and my blood is real drink. The one who eats my body and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. Wow. The Father of life sent me, and he is my life. In the same way, the one who feeds upon me, I will become his life. I am not like the bread your ancestors ate and later died. I am the living bread that comes from heaven. Eat this bread and you will live forever. And again, they didn't get it, right? And they didn't have Holy Spirit. So I, I can see why that would be hard to receive, right? Like, eat my body, drink my blood. That's weird, right? Yeah. It's weird. But they were, but they, again, they were offended by this message. They were disgusted. It even says, that's disgusting in the Passion Translation. How could anybody accept it? Jesus knew they were outraged and told them, are you offended over my teaching? Wow. Wow. What will you do when you see the Son of Man ascending into the realm from where he came? Like, you think you're offended now? Just wait till I die raise again, and then ascend it to my Father that I've been telling you about all along. Like, what are you going to feel like then? So 
So we don't even know sometimes that it's a fence that we're up against. I, I think offense can be masked as self-righteousness, lofty opinions, mm, wow. and even indifference. We don't really know we're struggling with it until we're faced with acknowledging that we are easily angered, quick to judge, quick to compare, constantly needing to be heard or have the final word. Our gut reaction isn't to consider the other person or to give the benefit of the doubt, and if we do, it hurts our pride a little, if not a lot. And so offense is a trap that we will fall into unless we are on guard against it. And so you all get that, right? Offense is bad. We want to be on guard. So like, I really want to spend the next few moments talking about the latter part of this message, was that his love defends us. He offers us a better way, another better way, which brings us to his love defending and protecting us. And so tonight, I really believe Jesus, Jesus told me he wants to do three things tonight. He wants to embrace you. He wants to encourage you. And he wants to empower you. I'm just going to read this because I believe there is something stirring in the heavens for tonight. There is an anticipation about what is available for you. And I felt this great expectation because I believe it's Jesus' heart. And if you're finding yourself struggling with offense towards yourself, someone else, or even Jesus, he wants to take that from you once and for all. He can and he will. And I'm so confident of that because he did it for me. In 2015, I ended a four-year relationship with a man I was convinced I was going to marry. We had baby names, and you know, when you think you're going to marry someone, you just go there, right? And so I thought this man was my husband. I spent four years investing in this relationship with him. But circumstances happened, and that ended. A year later, I found myself engaged to another man. But again, I didn't have peace. And I ended up breaking off the engagement. That was July of 2017. So for the past four years, since 2015, I've been telling myself that it was my fault that I was not yet married or had a family. Here I was, 32 years old, Still single and no children. I see everyone around me. I know you all are like college students, so like, or a little older, so this might not be so relevant to you. But for me, I saw everyone around me getting engaged, married, having their first, second, third child. I thought I was behind on the timeline. I hit it well, but I was very angry and frustrated. I couldn't celebrate other people in their seasons of celebration. It was awful. I couldn't get over my own disappointment. And the thing is, I really wasn't even mad at God. I blamed myself for my choices. For not one, but two failed relationships. And believed that now I was paying the consequences of those decisions. I really lived under it's my fault and I deserve it type of mentality. The Bible talks about reaping and sowing, right? And so, this is what I had sown. God wasn't to blame. I was. It was my fault. The root of my offense was actually me. And this mindset spilled over into every relationship with Kyle, with my family, with my coworkers. I was hypersensitive exasperated with others. Like I, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I really didn't know who I was. This entire paradigm formed in my thinking because I believed the lie that I had somehow missed it. And I thought the only thing that would ever change that was that if my marital status changed. 
my offense was holding me captive. I was entrapped to my to my offense. Is that a word? Entrapped? Yeah. yeah. It works. We're gonna we're gonna say it's a word. I understood. Thank you. All right. I, I really did and so this and so I felt stagnant in my pursuit with Jesus. I didn't feel like I was rushing head I wasn't like living in sin, right? I wasn't like falling backwards into that, but I definitely wasn't moving forward. I was definitely just treading water. And I had no idea how to gain momentum again. Until four weeks ago. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sitting down at dinner with a good, um, with some good friends of mine, Great and Ashley Lewis. Great spoke here at one of the collective yep. gatherings. Yep. Really dear, dear friends of mine. And I had gotten to spend the evening with Grant, Ashley, and their kids. But then the kids and Grant went to bed, and it was just me and Ashley sitting on the couch. And she was like checking in with me, like, how are you doing? And I, I don't even remember exactly what I said, but I guess my language impressed upon her something. And so she, she was prompted to ask me the question, you blame yourself, don't you? Wow. Like, yeah. Duh. Of course I blame myself. Like, it's my fault, isn't it? And she just looked at me like waiting for me to like ask myself that out loud. I was like, wait, it's not, it's not my fault? And I heard Jesus say, it's not your fault. Wow, wow, wow. In that moment, the blame literally like walked out the door. Come on, yeah, yeah. yeah. dropped on me that I hadn't missed my season. The Lord wasn't punishing me. <laughs> he was protecting me. Yeah. Wow. Good. He was always working on my behalf. Mm. Always. The timing of my season was not lost. It just wasn't my time yet. <laughs> and that knowledge, that kindness, that simplicity like wrecked me and I was like a puddle of snot and tears for like 20 minutes. <laughs> Ashley, she just loved on me. <laughs> yes. And so guys, maybe you can't relate to my story. Maybe the root of your offense was caused by someone else. A mother. A father. A brother. A sister. A teacher. A coach. A friend mentor, a boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife, or maybe you are offended at Jesus and you just can't seem to get over how you think he's let you down. Whatever your story, I really believe Jesus' message to us is the same. You haven't missed your season. He isn't punishing you. He is protecting you. He doesn't blame you. He doesn't shame you. He doesn't carry any offense towards you, and your offense will not cause him to walk away. He still chooses you even if you don't choose him. He loves you. You're his kid. And so I think what he's trying to tell us tonight is that this is what gets in our way from getting where we are now to where God wants to take us. Mm. I felt like he, in that moment, said, it's time, Danielle. Take my hand, and we're going to keep moving. You're not going to stay here anymore. No, and no. you don't have to stay here anymore. And if you question if Jesus wants to do this for you, then please don't, because I believe part of my deliverance and the timing of it was for now was for this occasion so that you too could encounter perfect love and leave this place lighter, freer, and more you. That's good. Amen. Come yeah. on. That's good. I will always remember that night with my friend, Ashley. 
it, it has it will mark it has marked me forever. And I believe tonight can mark your lives too. And if you need more evidence of this, Jesus has shown us all throughout scriptures that he longs to heal us of our hurts, our pain, and our lost time. He wants to redeem it all. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus ministered from place to place throughout all the province of Galilee. He taught in the synagogues, preaching the hope of the kingdom realm and healing every kind of sickness and disease among the people. Many people who were in pain and suffering with every kind of illness were brought to Jesus for their healing. Epileptics, paralytics, and those tormented by demonic power were all set free. Everyone who was brought to Jesus was healed. He didn't turn a single person away. And in chapter 8, a leper throws himself at the feet of Jesus and he says, You can heal me if you really want to. Can you just imagine that? Like this leper who no one wants to be around. Like he throws himself at the mercy of Jesus and he says, You, I know, Master, I know you can heal me if you really want to. Jesus says, Of course I want to. Like, be healed. Like, of course I want to heal you. That is his heart. Of course, like, he wants to take it all from you. And so I don't know. Maybe you're good, and this doesn't resonate with you at all. But if there is anything that you're believing about yourself, past failures, mistakes, mess-ups, or whatever offense you're carrying, I'm here to tell you that the love of God is here and available yeah, yeah. right well, now. Well, yeah. He doesn't want you to wake up one more morning carrying the burden of offense on your shoulders. Right. He wants you to uproot that thing. And he's going to walk it out the door. And, and I believe that God is so patient with us in our process, wherever we are. He's yeah. so patient, right? He was so patient for four years. Oh, my goodness. It's not going to It's not gonna be four years for you, right? Yeah. It's time we lay down these things. And I'm going to leave you all with this last story. I believe one of the greatest examples of this love is the exchange between Peter and Jesus. We all know this story. On the eve of Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus prophesies, tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, no way. I would never deny you. I would die for you. And Jesus says, no, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. And he does. He denies Jesus on three different occasions. Any relationship with Jesus. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt after that? He denied his Lord. His Savior. His King. And his friend. Can you imagine the shame and blame he must have felt? I know this isn't necessarily a story of offense on Peter's end. But if there was ever a time Jesus might have been offended, this was it, right? His very own denied him, not once, not twice, but three times. And I love Jesus' response. And so Jesus. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Because this is our lover, Jesus. And I think that is the question that he's asking tonight. He is asking each of us, do you love me? Because if you do, feed my lambs and tend to my sheep. In other words, take special care of my children even the ones that offend you. Jesus was our example. And if we're really going to imitate his life, like Nathan was talking about last week, but I think this is a big part of it. We need to be tender and quick to forgive like Jesus. And we really can't 
do this sincerely and completely until we release our right to our offenses. So I'm just going to ask everyone to close your eyes. No one's looking around. This time is just between you and Jesus. Get honest. What offenses are you still holding on to? If any. Or who has offended you? And it's often the very first person that comes to your mind or very first thing that pops into your mind. And I want to give you permission to be angry. To be hurt. To feel misunderstood. And to just sit with that for a minute. Because we're not going to stay there. But I just want you to acknowledge that it's there.
Amen.